This is Henry Simon, bringing you another story from my files here at the Missing Persons Bureau. In these stories of the Missing Persons Bureau, dramatized for Henry Simon by Ross Napier, names and addresses have, for obvious reasons, been changed. In one moment, the search for Ellsworth Aintree. Address unknown. And here again is Henry Simon. It is inherent in our natures that we should support the underdog of any particular struggle or contest we might happen to witness. In most forms of sport, for example, gambling aside, the novice is favoured over the veteran, the challenger over the champion, and so on. We enjoy seeing the outsider emerge triumphant. That again, of course, assuming that our money is not upon the favourite. Possibly this is because we find it easier to identify ourselves with the underdogs. Or perhaps it's simply a product of our insatiable appetite for the unexpected. But whatever it may be, one thing is certain. We like to see the little man win. Now, you're probably wondering where all this is going to lead. The answer is quite simple. For the story which I'm about to relate is the one which lends itself to the title David and Goliath. It had its beginning for us here at the Missing Persons Bureau on a warm August morning in 1954. I happened to be browsing through some old files when Pauline rang through to announce the arrival of my 10.30 appointment. A certain Samuel Hawthorne. He was short and fat. His hair, what there was of it, was a sandy grey. He wore a bright green sports jacket and a sickly orange necktie. His age, I estimated, as being somewhere between 50 and 60. His profession I didn't have to estimate, for he lost no time whatever in telling me. Oh, I'm a showman, Mr. Simon, one of the old brigade. A carnival showman? That's right. Been in the business now on 50 years, ever since I was a nipper. Something of a veteran, eh? Well, like my dad and granddad before me. It's the only life I've ever known. Touring about the country, living on the canvas. You had your own show? Well, uh, that's what I kind of see about. Uh -huh. I did have till a few days ago. And what a show it was. Best meal ticket a man ever had. Dragged them in like flies, we did. <laughs> packed tent at every performance. And why I say packed, I don't mean just crowded. I mean blistering at the seams. Crammed to capacity so you couldn't draw a breath. What's more, there wasn't no one didn't get their money's worth. Every penny of it. And there's all too few in my game that can make that boast. I won't dispute that point with you. What form did it take exactly? Hey? Eh? What kind of a show was it? Oh, to tell you that, I'll have to explain how it come about. It was a few years back when we was down in Brighton for the summer season, me and uh, Charlie Graves. He's just under eight feet tall, Charlie is, and as strong as a ruddy ox. We had this strong man act, see? He used to bend steel bars, lift weights, you know the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then he'd offer to take on all comers. Anyone who could stay in the ring with him for two minutes got a fiver. Yes. Well, uh, Charlie being an ex-wrestler into the bargain, our money was pretty safe. No one ever looked like going the distance with him. Not uh, till one day, just near the end of the season. It was at Saturday afternoon. We had a big crowd gathered round. But when I called for volunteers, not a soul come forward. Finally, I upped the stake to ten quid. The next thing you know, I heard a voice taking up the challenge. Well, I looks down and there he is, tripping off his shirt, as calm as you please. There, who is? His name was Ellsworth Eintree. At first, I thought he was just a kid. But when he stepped up on the platform, I could see he was as old as Charlie. It just so happened he was a midget. A bare three feet high. And he wanted to wrestle your strong man. Dead set on it, he was. We didn't allow it, surely. Well, I couldn't do nothing to stop it. He'd accepted the challenge, and that was that. I'd have been best to talk him out of it, of course, but he wasn't having any. The only thing I could do was to tell Charlie to go easy on him. Uh, treat him uh, gentle-like. Mm -hmm. So, what happened? It was all over in ten seconds flat. He wasn't hurt, I trust. The midget wasn't, no. Charlie was in hospital for a week, fractured shoulder. Charlie? The little fella tossed him clear out of the ring. All seventeen stone of him. But in all me born days, I've never seen nothing like it. Three feet high, that's all. And you'd have thought Charlie was a bag of feathers the way he sailed over them ropes. It all happened so fast it was over before it began. And the crowd, you should have heard them, went mad they did. Had to get the roses in to quiet them down. Small wonder. So we did our ten quid. But that wasn't the end of it, not by any stretch of the imagination. It was only the beginning. As soon as I paid him off, I says to him, 
Ellsworth, I says. How would you like to work for me? Who offered him a job? Well, more than a job. I offered him star billing and a new act. When I see how the crowd carried on, it come to me in a flash. This is the sort of thing they really like to see. Not the ordinary old wrestling match between two bruisers, but a wrestling match between a giant and a midget, with a midget coming out on top. And no fakery about it, mind. When it comes to the test, Ellsworth could toss Charlie every time. Apart from being three foot nothing of solid muscle, he was a judo expert, see? One flick of the wrist and Bob's your uncle. Did he accept your offer? Uh, he wasn't too keen on the idea right off. But when I promised him 30 quid a week regular, plus monthly bonuses, uh, he soon came round. Then and there I signed him up. And when Charlie came out of the hospital, we put the act on the road. From the word go, it was a sellout. In the very first week, we cleared 250 quid sheer profit. Like I said, wherever we went, at every performance, we packed them in like sardines. For three years, it kept up. We topped every carnival bill in the country. What's more, between the three of us, we made a mint. For the first time in my life, I've got a bank account. And a big one. Same with Charlie. And Ellsworth? Well, he's even better off than we are. Today he'd be worth mm, 10,000 smackers if he's worth a penny. And when I picked him up in Brighton three years back, he never had a penny to bless himself. I take it you're no longer associated. Well, me and Charlie is. But Ellsworth, he's disappeared. Oh? Well, that's why I'm here. I want him found and fast. What were the circumstances of his disappearance, exactly? Well, there weren't none. He just up and shoved off. When was this? Four or five days ago now. And here we are, due to open in London beginning of next week. So from where? The Emperor's Hall. Got a feature booking for six weeks. I see, you're no longer on the road, then. Well, he was, till the end of last month. Then we come up to London to brush up the act. Well, I mean to say, we've never been booked for nothing like this before. We wanted to make the most of it, rehearse a few new twists. Get everything right. But without Ellsworth... Without Ellsworth, we just don't have an act. I see. Where did he disappear from? The Gladstone Hotel. Uh, uh -huh. That's where we were staying. Uh -huh. uh, last Friday morning, it was. I went to his room to fetch him down for breakfast. And he'd gone. Cleared out. Earlier that morning or on the previous evening? Couldn't say for sure. No one saw him going. He left no message, no sort of explanation? He didn't leave nothing. Not even his share of the bill. Have you any idea at all what might have prompted him to depart so mm. very abruptly? Not a foggiest. He was one of them unpredictable types. I could never work him out. Were relations between you at all strained? More, well, wouldn't say strained exactly. Well, we've never been what you call bosom chums, but we managed to get on well enough. The thing is, he was never satisfied. With what? With anything. And all the time we was together, I never saw him smile once. Didn't matter how good the act was going or how much lolly he was making. He always looked as if he'd just lost his last sixpence. Or perhaps the life didn't agree with him. Well, he didn't have nothing to complain about. He was doing all right by it. Does he happen to have any family, any sort of close relatives? Never mentioned them. Never mentioned nobody. He wasn't married or anything like that. If he was, he was keeping it to himself. Do you know anything at all about his private life? Huh? Not even where he come from. What was he doing in Brighton? He never said. This could be very difficult, you know. How old is he? Oh, what? Thirty or thereabouts. Could be more. And he's only three feet tall? Three feet, one and a half inches, to be exact. Oh, I've got a photo of him here, if uh, that'll help. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Rather a boyish face. Not so boyish when you look into it. Yeah. See here. Them wrinkles. Well, normally they don't show. Uh, only when you get up real close to him. In some ways he puts me in mind of a little old man. How did he get on with Charlie? Oh, so so. <laughs> he had him bluffed proper. Bluffed? And Charlie was scared stiff of him. Why? Ever since the first time he got thrown out of the ring. He, he's looked on him as being some sort of supernatural being. He's all brawn, is Charlie. Not much up on top. Oh, I see. Plenty of art, though. Give you the shot of his back, he would. Which is more than could be said for little Davy. Davy? Ellsworth. That's how he's known in the business. He and Charlie, they, they get the villains straight from the Bible. Oh? David and Goliath. Ellsworth must be quite a boy, Chief. Three feet tall, and he can look a guy almost three times his size. A 17-stone strong man at that. Yes, it does seem incredible. You sure Hawthorne was on the level when he said the act was legitimate? I'm not sure of anything, Study. I'm just repeating what he told me. He certainly had no cause that I can think of to be otherwise. Well, I'd sure like to see it done. You and how many others, I wonder? Huh? Therein lies the secret of his success. People come to hear of it, you see, that they've got to see it before they are going to believe it. To see it, they have to pay the price of a ticket. Exactly. Well, we should worry. If we find Ellsworth in time, I guess we'll be entitled to a couple of complimentaries. Unfortunately, that same is a rather big one, study. 
We have nothing whatever to go on, you know, except... Yes? Mr. Simon? Yes? Sorry to barge in like this. There was no one in the office and My I... secretary happens to be at lunch. Oh, well, uh, I'd like to talk to you private, like, if you don't mind. Not at all. Well, this is my assistant, Mr. Study. How'd you do? Hi. Well, I'll leave you to it, Chief. Fine, I'll buzz if I need you. Well, now, sit down, won't you? Oh, uh, thanks. Mr. Graves, isn't it? That's right. Charlie Graves. How'd you know? Partly guesswork, partly deduction. I happen to be familiar with the measurements of that door where you bumped your head on as you came through. Which in itself, of course, was a fair enough clue. There can't be too many men in London who are eight feet tall. Henry Simon returns to continue this story in just a moment. And here again is Henry Simon. I can think of no single word to describe Charlie Graves other than gigantic. He was indeed a mountain of a man, and I didn't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to guess his identity, especially as his employer, Sam Hawthorne, had left my office not an hour before. What I couldn't guess, however, was the reason for his visit, nor under the circumstances did I have the slightest inclination to try. Well, now, before going any further, Mr. Graves, I think perhaps it might be a very good idea if you were to tell me just why it is you've come. You, uh, you won't tell Sam, will you? Not if you don't wish me to, but... He uh, doesn't know I've come, see. So he'd bust his boiler if he found out. He warned me not to poke me nose in. He warned you? When he told me he was going to come here, I tried to talk him out of it, but he got all steamed up. Almost bit me head off. Why did you try to talk him out of it, exactly? Don't you want Ellsworth found? No. Why not? Because... Because we was better off without him. Not according to Mr. Hawthorne. Sam's trouble is he thinks too much about money and not enough about people. We was doing fine before Ellsworth joined the act. We was making enough to get by on and everything was nice and friendly. Then he comes and spoils it all. The money started rolling in, but it just wasn't the same anymore. You don't like Ellsworth, is that it? Oh, it ain't, but I don't like him. He just bothers me, that's all. He ain't one of us. Never has been. Besides, a little fella like that. He just ain't natural. What isn't? Thirty-seven inches high and he flings me around like a matchstick. No one ever made a dent in me before. But since I've been working with him, I've been in hospital seven times. Everyone thinks it's a great joke. But there's nothing funny about it. Not for me. All my life I've been a strong man. Now I'm nothing but a tub of jelly. I've got me pride, Mr. Simon. I don't like being laughed at. Even though you're being well paid for it? I'd rather be respected. I see. So it all boils down to the fact that you're tired of being humiliated. You have nothing against Ellsworth personally. You just don't want him back in the end. What if a Sam's paying you to find him? I'll double it if you don't. Hmm... You're booked to open at the Emperor's Hall on Monday. I want to hit the road again. London don't agree with me. What made Ellsworth clear out? Have you any idea? Oh, I don't know nothing about it. I just know he's gone. He wasn't happy working for Mr. Hawthorne? He wouldn't be happy working for nobody. Like he said to Sadie once, he don't like being tied down. Sadie? Sadie, Sadie Robson. She's a midget too, even small than Ellsworth. That's a balancing act. Was all on the same bill at Blackpool last year. She and Ellsworth were friends? She's the only one I ever seen make him smile. They weren't by any chance uh, romantically involved. If I was, I'd never let on to nobody. Where is she now? Sadie? Mm. Oh, somewhere on the circuit. Probably back in Blackpool. Here in August, August she would be. I ain't seen her since last season. Has Ellsworth? No reason he should have. Why? Well, I was just wondering. Well, what about it, Mr. Simon? Will you do like I say? I'd like to oblige you, Charlie. I'm afraid I've already committed myself. Committed? I told Sam Hawthorne I'd, I'd do whatever I could for him. I just can't go back on my But word. I'm telling you, I'll pay you double. I will, I will. It's not a question of money, Charlie. It's a question of ethics. Besides, even if we succeed in tracing Ellsworth, there's no certainty he'll agree to return to the act. Sam will see to it he does. In that case, I'm afraid you'll just have to make the very best of it. However, of course, he has to be found first. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have come. I had a feeling it wouldn't do no good. But I'd try. You do understand my position. Yeah. 
I understand. I just wish there was someone could understand mine. There was something curiously touching about Charlie Graves that made one instinctively want to help him. Unfortunately, of course, my hands were tied. And there was little I could do except instruct study to proceed with the investigation. Ironically enough, the giant had unwittingly supplied us with a lead, namely Sadie Robson, the female midget, who had appeared on the same bill as our quarry in Blackpool the previous year, and with whom he'd been very friendly. Accordingly, we contacted the variety agent in Blackpool, who duly verified the fact that Miss Robson was appearing in the first half of the programme at the Blackpool Tower. So it was on the following day, shortly before noon, that study arrived at the famed seaside pleasure resort. It was the peak of the summer season, and the promenade was a hive of bustling activity, a seething mess of stalls, sideshows, and sweating humanity. On the beach, every spare inch was taken up by a solid carpet of sunbathers basking on the sand. A dazzling pattern of brightly coloured costumes and simmering flesh, broken only by the shadow of the great Blackpool Tower, hovering above it all like some prehistoric beast watching over its young. In the massive foyer of the tower, Study made his way to an inquiry desk where he spoke to the reception clerk who was on duty. I uh, understand you have a Miss Sadie Robson appearing in the show here. Robson? Uh, she's a midget, does some kind of a balancing act. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, very clever. Well, I have an urgent message for her. Any idea where she might be? Well, she has a matinee performance at three. Well, I'm afraid it's a little long for me to wait. If I could catch her at her hotel or wherever she's staying, uh, I think I... Just a moment, uh, should have a note of it here somewhere. Uh, uh, people are always making inquiries, uh, wanting to know where... Uh... Ah, there we are. Miss Sadie Robson, care of the Paradise Hotel. At the Paradise Hotel in Minstrel Road, study was directed to a room on the second floor, where, in answer to his knock, the door was opened by the young lady in question. He'd expected her to be tiny, but not quite as tiny as she was. A bare 28 inches tall. Perfectly proportioned, she might have been a small child, but for the fact that her face was that of a mature and very attractive woman. Please sit down, Mr. Study. I haven't much to offer you in the way of liquid refreshment, but if you'd care for a glass of beer... Well, not right now, thanks, Miss Robson. I'm kind of pressed for time. The name is Sadie. No one ever calls me Miss Robson. All right, Sadie, it is, then. What is it you want to know about Ellsworth, exactly? Anything you can tell me. According to my information, you were fairly well acquainted. He's a very fine person. Uh Uh-huh. Well, were you just friends, or did it go deeper than that? I'll be perfectly frank with you. On my side, it went a lot deeper. But I'm afraid my feelings weren't returned. I had hoped that we might... Oh, he was a strange man. I could never quite make him out. When did you see him last? Last year, when he was here. Have you been in touch at all since then? He wrote me once or twice, just a few lines, nothing of any consequence. What could have made him clear out, any notion? He was pretty fed up with things. Why? Oh, he just was. The kind of life he was leading depressed him, got him down. Did he tell you that? He didn't have to. It was obvious. Well, he was doing well enough financially. That was the only thing that kept him going. If the act hadn't been such a success, he couldn't have stuck it a week. Even as it was, he had to drive himself to carry on. He told me once that as soon as he had enough money saved, he was going to buy some land, settle down. Maybe that's what he's done. Did he mention any particular place he had a fancy for? No, not that I recall, unless... Yeah? Yeah. One Sunday, we went on a picnic to Kirkham, just the two of us. We had lunch in a field about a mile from the town. It was a lovely spot, trees and a little brook. Very beautiful. I remember asking him how he'd known about it, and he said he'd been there before, quite often. Was it private land? Oh, I imagine so. No one bothered us, though. There was an old house with a thatched roof further along the stream. Probably belonged to the people who lived there. Anyway, to finish the story, on the way back here in the bus, he said something about fencing it off so he'd have it all to himself. Fencing it off? I assumed he was joking. And until now, I'd forgotten about it. 
Maybe I ought to take a look at this place. How do I get there? And I'd come with you if I could spare the time, but I've got a map near three. Well, that's okay if you could just direct me. I'm probably sending you on a wild goose chase. Sure, but don't let it worry you. I've chased so many wild geese in my time, one more won't hurt me. Two hours later, study alighted from a bus on the outskirts of Kirkham, a town some five miles inland, southeast of Blackpool. Following the directions given him by Sadie Robson, he then proceeded across country on foot until he reached a narrow stream, which led him at length to a rickety wooden footbridge. Crossing this, he found himself in just such a field as Miss Robson had described, even to the trees that shelter the banks of the brook. I don't know if you're aware of it, my friend, but this is private property. The voice came from behind him, and turning, the agent found himself confronted by a man in a straw hat and khaki overalls. A perfectly ordinary-looking man, except for the fact that he was only three feet tall. I don't think I understand, Mr. Study. You say Sadie sent you here? She directed me, yes. But how did she know? I was planning to surprise her. Well, maybe you'd better ask her that. She's kind of looking forward to hearing from you again. For that matter, so is Sam Hawthorne. I'll bet he is. Well, he's a mighty worried man. What made you run out on him like you did? There was no other way. I knew if I'd told him I was going, he'd have found some means of stopping me. But now it's too late. I've made the break, and there's not a darn thing he can do about it. I didn't want to go to London in the first place. He knew that. But it didn't stop him going ahead with the arrangements. Not that I blame him for trying to feather his own nest. We all have to look out for ourselves. But Sam's had his own way for too long. I decided it was time I had mine for a change. I've got nothing against him, you understand? It's just that he's blind to anyone else's point of view. You didn't like working for him, eh? I loathed it from the very beginning. What made you team up with him? I needed money. It was the only way I could get it. At the time, I had no definite plans for the future. I just knew I wanted a place of my own, where I could settle down and lead a normal life. Forget I was different from other people. A place like this, sir? Huh? I discovered it last year, when we were playing in Blackpool. The moment I saw it, I knew exactly what I'd been looking for. An estate agent in Kirkham put me onto it. It was up for sale. I didn't have enough money to buy it outright, so I put down a deposit. <laughs> Paid off the balance in monthly installments. Five days ago, it became mine. The house, the land, and everything on it. For the first time in my life, Mr. Study, I, I belong somewhere. You can't imagine just how much that means to someone like me. To be free, to know that I'll never again be forced to exhibit myself as a freak put on show for people to stare at and make fun of. For so long, I endured it as a means to an end. But now it's behind me, and that's where it's going to stay. Well, fair enough. Hope it works out. It will. I'll see to that. But there are still two things to be done. Oh? Uh -huh. The first is to marry Sadie. If she'll have me. Well, I guess you're at an even chance. The second is to build that fence. Henry Simon returns to conclude this story in just a moment. And here again is Henry Simon. On his return to London, Study made a full report to Sam Hawthorne, who, needless to say, left at once for Kirkham. He could have saved himself the trouble, however, for Ellsworth Aintree was not to be swayed from his resolution. And there was little indeed that Hawthorne could do, except, of course, cancel the London booking. I understand that he and Charlie Graves have since reverted to their former act, and are now back on the road again. As for Ellsworth, well, he and Sadie Robson were married soon after. A union that was preceded, no doubt, by the building of a fence. And now, this is Henry Simon, inviting you to meet me here again, and for the present, bidding you au revoir. Mm -hmm.